This coming Sunday night is Shavuot, when the Jewish nation received the Torah on Mount Sinai. It is the 50th day since Passover when the Jews left Egypt and experienced several miracles, including the splitting of the Sea of Reeds, that prepared them for this extraordinary revelation. The energy experienced on events like this one occur every year on the same date. As preparation for such a mystical and magical day, I'm privileged to share this episode with Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson, one of America's premier Jewish scholars in Torah and Jewish mysticism. Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Y.Y. Jacobson is one of the most sought after speakers in the Jewish world today, lecturing to Jewish and non-Jewish audiences on six continents and in 40 states and serving as a teacher and mentor to thousands across the globe. He's considered to be one of the most successful, passionate, and mesmerizing communicators of Judaism today, culling his ideas from the entire spectrum of Jewish thought and making them relevant to contemporary audiences. Rabbi Jacobson founded and serves as dean of the yeshiva.net, teaching via the web one of the largest Torah classes in the world today with thousands of students globally. I highly recommend tuning into his classes on YouTube or on his website. If you like this episode or any of the previous episodes, please leave me a review about the show and today's guest on Apple Podcasts. Also head over to SolomonEzra.com or follow me on Instagram at King underscore Solomon 8 and Facebook Solomon Ezra Brezin to learn more. Also subscribe to my YouTube channel Solomon Brezin to get updates on new videos and podcasts and be sure to smash the like button on the videos. May each and every one of us open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to receive the divine light tailored for our own lives and know that each of us is a manifestation of divine consciousness in this world. Now onto the show with Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson. It's, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, speak with you and, and uh, open up a conversation. I've been Thank listening you. to your class, you know, for probably close to two, three years now, different classes. And I have a whole uh, on this notes, online notes that I take, just a bunch of notes from all your different shears for there's through the Parsha, the different Maimarim, and it's been uh, just a lot of fun and very interesting. Hey, amazing. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, I hope you uh, pass on the inspiration to other people. God willing, that's that's the journey. That's the, that's the intention. Excellent. I'm working on it. I found it really cool just to, to start and then before I, or as, uh, as I ask you about the, your background and for other people listening, it was cool. I was learning today or a couple of, learning today also like in the Tanya lesson. And um, whenever I've listened to some of your uh, classes, you talk about Ratzo Vashuv. And that's really before I even knew what Ratzo Vashuv is, that's what the, the name of my podcast, Ebb and Flow, is really all about. How that rhythmical pattern of life that we have is, uh, you know, constant ebbs and flows or Ratzo Vashuv, which means running and returning. And it was saying today in like the Tanya lesson that uh, in, in the times of uh, Mashiach, in the times of the mess Messianic times, that uh, the Levites, which is the tribe I come from, will be elevated to a Kohen. And the songs that they will be singing is like a Ratzo Vashuv. So could you, could you explain a little bit about this whole concept of uh, yeah. running and returning and yeah, all of that, yeah. that, I intend, that I intended with the, the podcast, but really, I'm, and as I, as I interview more people and learn about it myself, cultivating such a deeper um, understanding of what it means. Yeah. So you're referring, I assume, to the 50th chapter of Tanya, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the theme, one of the big themes over there is that in Kabbalah, there are two states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. One is called, I would call, tension, and the other one is resolution. Mm -hmm. One is the longing to escape the status quo, desire to emancipate myself from where I am. Because wherever I am, I feel stuck. I spoke to somebody today, a little earlier. The person says to me, I have one desire. I want to die in peace. 
can you help me die in peace? That was very powerful to hear, like somebody telling you, I just want to die. And when I close my eyes for the last time, I wanted to be able to be peacefully, peaceful. Because something was eating up at her. Something is, is eating up at us. Something that I feel like I have to escape. I have to run away. I have to leave. I have to discover more. I have to challenge myself. I have to make amends. I have to apologize. I have to get an apology. Something that's, that irks me. That's one state of consciousness. But there's the opposite state of consciousness, which is called shuv, mm -hmm. is resolution, calm, returning to yourself, accepting what you have, embracing your identity, making peace with who you are, making peace with your world, making peace with your reality. Now, according to Kabbalah, it's an ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. The signal of life, the rhythm of life is comprised of Ratzai and Shoiv. Because if we only had Ratzai without Shoiv, yeah. it would be a perpetual tension and sense of peacelessness. If we only had Shoiv without Ratzai, we would become so smug and complacent and numb and frozen and lifeless. So it's the tension of Ratzai and the resolution of Shov that creates the very rhythm of the divine symphony we call consciousness and life. It begins with Ezekiel chapter one. He says, Vahachayis Ratzai Vashayiv, the angelic beings are running, they're yearning, they're, they're longing, and they're retreating, they're returning. And uh, the author of the Tanya Bashnei Zaman of Liadi and many of the other great spiritual masters often show how the very biological rhythm of life is based on this ebb and flow. Yeah. The heart, for example, they call it fiku de liba, the heartbeat. The heart contracts and then it expands. And if it only contracts or only expands, there's no circulatory system, there's no oxygen, there's no life. So the heart contracts and then the heart expands. Mm -hmm. It's the rhythm that's constantly necessary and essential to life. And the same is true with the, breath. with the breath. So we inhale and then we exhale. And it's constantly that rotze and that shoy, the inhaling and the exhaling. And one without the other, you know, if we just inhale or we just exhale, again, there's no life. So the very systems of biology, both within the macro and the micro, both within the physical universe and the metaphysical reality, are all defined by that rhythm of Ratzi V'shoif. And it's difficult because we often get stuck in wanting to be in one space, but only way we can embrace the value of the paradox can we actually begin to suck the marrow out of life and live every moment to its fullest. And in addition, I love how when, when, when somebody really personalizes that life is a constant ebbs and flows, you can almost, you can rise above whatever you're currently experiencing because, you know, not only will it, <clears throat> this too shall pass as King Solomon said, but it's almost like it, it, it's not ebb or flow, but it's an ebb and flow because you know, it's, it's such a greater... Exactly. And, 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 and it's always continuing. In other words, I reach Ratzoi and then I come back to Shoiv and now there's a deeper Ratzoi. Mm -hmm. And then there's a deeper Shoiv yeah. to a deeper Ratzoi and to a deeper Shoiv and it continues. Fascinating. So just to rewind a little bit, yeah. yeah it's, it's missing. You know, this Shoiv without Ratzoi, it's not good. Yeah. Just to rewind a little bit, because uh, we started... A, uh, in some great topics. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, your background, how you grew up and, and got into the, the position that you have now. And you were, um, you had a very close relationship uh, with the Rebbe and um, 
doing with your brother and a couple others, um, memorizing the long shirim on Shabbat. Uh, but I'm, I'm just fascinated how at such a young age you were able to do that. And I think we can learn a lot from how you exercised these different uh, faculties and ability of your mind to, to learn so many sources of information and be able to grasp it and, and, and reach out to it mentally whenever you're giving a talk or talking to somebody. Okay. So I was born in 1972 in Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> in the Cronite section of Brooklyn. Both of my parents are refugees from the Stalin Soviet Union. My mother was born and grew up in Georgia. My father was born and grew up in a place called Ma Mamentovka, a suburb of Moscow. They both suffered terrible tyranny under the Stalinist regime. My grandfather, my father's father was arrested during the purges of 1938-39 tortured horribly, sentenced to death, tortured, sent into exile, ultimately liberated towards the end of the Second World War. Both of them escaped the Soviet Union. They escaped the Iron Curtain after the Holocaust, 1946. And they ultimately made their way to Europe and then to the United States of America, where they settled and married in the 1950s and raised a wonderful family, my family in New York. My father was a journalist M much of his life, I should say all of his adult life, his vocation was journalism. And he had the soul of a journalist. Today, the art of journalism is already somewhat obsolete because everyone today is a reporter with their iPhones. <laughs> or their podcasts. Everybody is a reporter and a broadcaster between Instagram and WhatsApp. Everybody is on top of the news and creating the news. Today, the challenge is how to filter out the news that's not vital because you know we're, we're we get so much stimulation but he was you know a real journalist in the era of yiddish journalism and jewish journalism in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and so on he was the daily he was the correspondent of the largest israeli daily the Yotachronot united nations he succeeded he succeeded uh, his colleague eli wiesel alias wiesel he worked for many other newspapers. He was the front page editor of a daily Yiddish newspaper called the Day Morning Journal. When it closed down, he opened up his own weekly newspaper. So anyway, that's the type of home I grew up in. It was a pretty yeah. open home, very diverse home, a lot of interesting, interesting guests that would come to visit my parents and a lot of interesting conversation. I also had the privilege of growing up at the feet of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, a blessed memory of Rebbe Mendel Schneerson who uh, was certainly considered one of the greatest Jewish leaders you know, of, uh, of our generation and maybe of many generations in terms of an impact probably on almost every Jewish community in the world, maybe every Jewish community in the world. And the Rebbe would uh, teach every Shabbos, every holiday, every Shabbos, he would teach for many hours. These were called Fabrengans. Fabringans are usually understood as kumzitzes. You know, you sit, you schmooze, you eat some, uh, you know, hot dogs or kishka or herring, and you sing nice songs with a guitar. But the Lubavitcher Fabringans were somewhat different, quote unquote. They can last anywhere from three to eight hours. And they were filled with incredible long presentations that were very profound and intricate, covering all aspects of Jewish thought. Jewish scholarship, Torah ideas, and relevant practical insights in life. And again, this can go for hours. The Lubavitcher Rebbe can analyze a piece of Talmud or Maimonides or Rashi or Zohar or Kabbalah, profound, you know, profound classes in various intricate halachic subjects, Talmudic subjects, very, very powerful, very deep, incredibly, incredibly, incredibly ingenious, creative and original. And then mysticism, a tremendous amount of mystical ideas, Kabbalah, Hasidus, Hasidism, Hashkafa, Mahshava, Musr, ethics, Jewish spirituality. 
from the whole gamut of Jewish scholarship from beginning of time until this very day. He had a breadth that was extraordinary and astounding, but he also had a depth that equaled his breadth. Also the power to apply it to life. These were extremely, extremely powerful moments that shaped my youth, shaped my Jewish experience, and I guess shaped my vocation today. When I was a young boy, my brother, uh, I would say, pulled me in to this group of oral scribes. And as I grew older, I became more and more involved with that group that was charged with the job of memorizing and transcribing the hour-long talks of the Lubavitcher Rebbe after Shabbos and holidays for publication. There were times, especially during holidays, that the Rebbe would speak a few days in an ongoing fashion without any tape, without any uh, recording devices. So for example, if uh, let's say Shmini Atzeres and Simchas Torah, right? With Thursday and Friday, yeah. So he would speak on Thursday. He would speak on Friday. He would speak on Shabbos early afternoon, Shabbos late, eve, late afternoon. Hours and hours of talks because the Rebbe would have a Fabrengen before Hakafas, and have a Fabrengen on Simchas Torah, a Fabrengen on Shabbos Bereshis. And you had here long discussions. There were Hasidic Maimorim, deep Maimorim, explanations on Rashi and on Rambam and on Gemara and on Sugis. Uh, I, I, I saw I should translate everything in English, right? Sure. Yeah. Every, every conceivable topic in Judaism, and then he would discuss Israel and current events and education and psychology and science. He also had a very broad knowledge in the secular sciences. And then discussed the emotional relevance to life and the state of Jewish affairs and, and what's going on in the world. It was like this mosaic and tapestry. And you didn't know what topics he's going to cover, but he could cover everything from psychology to education, from physics to biology, from geology to astrophysics, from cosmology to history, from Israeli affairs to political affairs, from the state of education in the United States of America, to profound ideas in Jewish law, biblical studies, Talmudic studies, mysticism, halacha, the legal codes, and everything in between. And being involved in that was extremely thrilling, exhilarating, electrifying, transformative, and also excruciatingly difficult, to be honest. But today, I think it's very, you know, I look back at it with a lot of nostalgia, of course, and really feel privileged of having the ability to travel the world. Today, it's traveling via Zoom, but till Corona was traveling the world, and really sharing a lot of the wisdom I learned and heard from the Rebbe over the years with Jewish and non-Jewish audiences the world over. How, how did you guys hone in and, and receive all the information to be able to transcribe it after the holiday or Shabbat ended? Were there any kind of mental uh, techniques you'd, you'd learned? Because I, recall, I recall hearing once you were mentioning that in that it was such a, the, the, the Rebbe had such a presence that you could just kind of open up and allow yourself to just listen to all the, whatever he was saying, and like you didn't have any other mental noise, otherwise it would get in the way. It's very, very true. And that was, that, that is indeed, it was, it is one of the main ingredients. Mm. Total suspension of any other mental noise. Something that's not an easy task to do. It's really suspending every aspect of one's intellectual ego and tuning in completely to the words, to the vibe, to the energy without any other mental distractions. And that's really difficult because usually when we listen to people speak, subconsciously, we are already thinking not about what they're saying, but about our responses to what they're saying. Mm -hmm. We're opinionated. We're like, you know, if I'm hearing a speech, this is good, this is boring, this I heard already, this I didn't hear already, this I'm going to use next week, right? Oh, this is a great one. I'm going to file this. Oh, I have to speak next Shabbos and about mitzvah. This is a great idea. In other words, I'm not listening to you. 
I'm developing opinions about you. It's very hard for us to really, really listen. I'm listening, but I'm already formulating my response. I'm listening, but I'm judging you. I'm listening, but I'm forming an opinion about you. You know, why do children remember everything? Sometimes you'll hear from a child 10 or 15 years later, something that happened when he or she was a toddler, and you forgot it, but they remember it. And the answer is because children actually listen. They naturally cultivate, they naturally possess the art of listening without mental <coughs> noise. Like wet sponges, they absorb it all and they absorb it in a deep way. The question is, as an adult, can I still be a child? Yeah. So when listening to the Rebbe, there was a fourth, there, of course, the prerequisite of people who are very involved in learning and very involved in learning the Rebbe's talks and shiurim and teachings and presentations and works because you had to familiar, familiarize yourself with his style and with his genre and with his perspectives. That's number one. Number two, you always had to be learning because he would quote from everywhere. The Rebbe had a tremendous, tremendous amount of encyclopedic knowledge, I would say, in all aspects of Torah, from the halachic to the mystical to the spiritual, to the hashkafic, to the Talmudic, to the biblical, to the midrashic, to the homiletical and everything in between. So you really had to constantly just sit and learn and learn and learn and, 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 and gain familiarity with as much as you can in order to be able to appreciate what he was saying. He wouldn't give out notes uh, beforehand of what he's going to talk about, and he wouldn't speak from notes. He didn't even usually didn't even have a paper of any notes. He would just, just a flow of consciousness. But a lot of it was prepared, I know. He said sometimes that he prepared. But uh, so you needed all that. But in addition to all of that, it was so important when listening to him that I and my colleagues would suspend everything and just really, really tune in completely to be able to absorb it. How, did, how are you able to practice this today? Like you were mentioning, how can we do that as adults? How do we do it today? Um, so, you know, I'm going to be very honest with you. <laughs> I hear people speak today, but I don't feel the same urgency to do it as I felt when the Lubavitcher Rebbe was talking for two reasons. First of all, um, I felt that this was historic. Yeah. Uh, that the Rebbe was a genius par excellence. He was one of the greatest Torah giants of his generation. And I think of many generations, the ability in one mind to contain so much, because there are a lot of great minds and geniuses, but the ability to really to master all streams of Torah. You have people who are great in Kabbalah. They're, they're unbelievable in Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. But to also have that same level of mastery of Talmudic law. And of every Rashi, and of every Taisvis, and of every Marshan, of every... Maram Shif, of every Rabbi Kiva Eger, of every Pnei Yeshua, of every commentary of the Vilna Gon on Shulchan Aruch. I'm just mentioning some of the well-known Talmudic commentaries. Some people are great in biblical studies. They know the whole Tanakh and the Medrash backwards and forwards. But would they know all the writings of Rabbi Isaac Luya, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, Rabbi Abraham Abulefia, and Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato and the Malbim? Not necessarily. Many people know Tremendous amount of Talmud, but to have a mastery of all of the Hasidic spiritual works and the works of ethics, not necessarily. And many people have a lot of that, but they know not much about mathematics or engineering or science or physics. So to be able to have a person who could combine all of this in one person and really create a mosaic and a tapestry in his own mind, because the Rebbe was a very organized thinker. He's known in the world as a social activist, but that actually was not who he really and naturally was. Yeah. This was a choice he made much later in life based on a calling. Naturally or organically, he was actually a very internalized, private citizen who was an extremely organized thinker, as we see from his writings of the early years, but we saw throughout all the years. So to be able to listen to such a person to speak, I was just in awe. There was, there, was, there was so much respect that I had reverence because I realized that this is a historic opportunity. 
The Rebbe is teaching Torah. It's coming out of the mouth of one of the greats, of one of the greatest of the generation. And if I don't remember it, it's going to be lost forever. It's not like the next day I can come in with a tape recorder and say, okay, Rebbe, repeat it all. That wouldn't happen. So it's now flowing through him. He's a conduit for this great light, for the infinite light of Torah, the infinite light of God, flowing through his, his mind, his mouth. And it's never, it's never going to be repeated again. That urgency for me felt like it's a moment in history that's never going to be repeated again. And you know what Hillel said, right? If not now, when, right? If not now, when? If I am not going to stand up right now and fulfill my responsibility, me and my colleagues, in retaining this, it, it, it may be lost forever. And uh, the urgency of it, I have to say, was very, very powerful because of the nature of the person and the nature, the nature of what he was teaching. Number two, I should add, of course, a continuation of number one, and that is the material was just fantastic. The material was f fascinating. It wasn't just the person and the genius, it's what came out. It's, it's, it was rich, it was beautiful, it was startling. I remember sometimes I would come out, the Rebbe would finish off a bringin, and I was like on a high. I was just, it was, there was, there was ecstasy. The, 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 the intellect, the keenness, the depth, the sharpness, the beauty, the beauty, and the love, and the passion, and the combination of all of this together, it was spiritually and intellectually intoxicating, and yet so relevant and earthly and practical. So this created such a powerful sense of, of, of urgency, a sense of a privilege to be able to try to hold on and to remember every possible word and syllable to the best of our ability. Wow. One tool. And we didn't always succeed. There were things that were forgotten. I knew myself in the later years, I knew I would repeat over the particular talk, let's say it went for an hour. And I knew that between subject A and subject C, there was a B and I couldn't remember it and I forgot it. And I would ask colleagues and friends and other rabbis, Sometimes they knew and sometimes they didn't. It was also so much, especially in his later years, it ever was much more brief, so he could cover hundreds of topics in one hour talk. In the earlier years, he would speak slower and he would develop it with, with more elaboration. But in his later years, it was much more brief and much more concise. He relied a lot on the previous year's presentations. So I remember it was painful, but I knew that we missed, we missed points, we missed ideas and they were irretrievable. We, we could not get back. The next Shabbos, even if the Rebbe would speak about the same subject, he would never say the same thing twice. Never. He would always, there was always something new. There was always something different. He was really a pulsating reservoir of, of, of infinite Torah wisdom. How do we keep our relationship with a great leader like this, pure, because the way I listen to you and when you deliver his teachings and, and make it your own, there are also some individuals that I feel, I feel like it, it could be easily, um, for lack of a better word, perverted and how somebody has a relationship with an individual like this. Not like one of yeah. one. He's he passed. It. He's yeah, it's a great question. But, uh, so this is always a challenge. Whenever you're in the presence of a great person, mm -hmm. it's easy for people to lose their individuality. Yes, and almost melt away. Which what, what did he what did he what did he say? I got to do that rather than is that what you mean? Right, right. And 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 sometimes sometimes people can use the great leader as a crutch. Mm -hmm. and as a substitute for developing themselves to their own maximum. He even addressed that, didn't he? He would address that often. As the late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the great Rabbi Jonathan of blessed memory, 
sometimes would say about the Rebbe, he said, you know, there are people, there are great, there are leaders and teachers and, and masters who create followers and disciples. He says, but the greatest leaders create leaders. Yeah. It was a beautiful insight and especially beautiful because I remember the Rebbe always insisted, urged, begged, demanded, pleaded with his students to make it their own. In other words, I can't live for you. I can inspire you. I can teach you. But ultimately, you have to find your own relationship with God, your own relationship with yourself, and realize that you have a mission in this world that nobody else can fulfill. You are a unique person. You were conceived in love, and there's something for you to contribute to our planet that nobody before you and nobody after you will ever be able to contribute. You are an indispensable note in the divine cosmic symphony and the music that your soul's violin can play. Nobody else can. So this was so important to the Rebbe because he did not want only students. He wanted much more than that. He wanted leaders. He wanted people who can go out and use their creativity and initiative to be able to suck the marrow out of life, to be able to maximize their potential, to be able to flex their muscles, to be able to become leaders, make decisions, and create change. And the only way you can do that is if you internalize the message, if you're not just you know, robotic. It has to really, really become yours in one way or another. <clears throat> um, moving on with, with that, or- It was sometimes an argument. Yeah. Um, there was sometimes an argument when we would review the talks. So there was an interesting argument that would take place sometimes. There were those who were insistent on saying over what's called by Chabad Hasidim, Oisius Harav, to repeat the very words and terminology that the Rebbe used. And there were others who felt they have to focus more on the concept, on the theme, not so much on the words. These were ongoing debates. It was one of the memorizers. He was like, you don't understand anything you're saying. You're just repeating words like a par parrot. You don't get it. <laughs> you have to understand it, right? But on the other hand, there was this tremendous beauty and value in, in just capturing the words of the Rebbe himself. Yeah. Those words was the foundation of the ideas. But it was an interesting debate that would happen sometimes. You, you mentioned uh, how it would always end with something practical and, and not yeah, just always. itself. The Rebbe, loathed, the Rebbe loathed ideas that didn't have practical relevance and would not change people's lives. So, what, so one, tool, <laughs> one tool that I have found very beneficial in my own life uh, in being able to learn all this information and kind of get out of my own way and and to then see how I can apply it is is meditation. How how have how did you at the time or how did he make it? Uh, what do you mean by he made it practical? Oh, the Rebbe had a very interesting custom that was uh, for me it was life changing in terms of my own Jewish Jewish learning. He can discuss an abstract concept in Talmud or Maimonides or Tanakh or Rashi, or Midrash, or Zohar, something that you would think is completely irrelevant to daily life. It's just some concept in Jewish law or Jewish spirituality. An example, the Rebbe once analyzed at length a, um, a, uh, a law in Tractate Baba Kama about a bull that gores three times, a domesticated bull that starts goring other animals and gores them three times. And that's when the bull becomes prone to goring because you see that it's constantly doing it. And that's when the owner really takes full responsibility. And the next time something happens, he has to pay full damage and full compensation because he should have known better. Just an example. So the Talmud says that if you sell the bull or you gift it to another person, the calculations start over again. In other words, you don't have to consider it a bull that's prone to gore. You have another three times. And if it, if it gores again for three times, you only have to pay half damages. Okay, this is a long discussion. This is a long discussion in Tractate Babakama, and it's articulated in Maimonides and Jewish law. 
And the Rebbe analyzed it from a halachic perspective. It doesn't make sense. If there's a bull here that's goring, why if I gift it to somebody, would the status change? So it's an interesting discussion for those who study Talmud, tractate Baba Kama. When he finished the discussion, he said, but every law in Torah, even those that don't seem relevant to us, most of us are not hanging out with bulls and cows goring, has ramifications to life. And he said, each of us has a bull in our own life. We each have an animal. The first three times the animal gores, it's not considered a bad habit that it's addicted to. It just happens randomly. But he says, after three times, it happens. Now it's a different status. And he started to explain what we would call today the difference between somebody who falls prey to a craving or somebody who's addicted to a and they lose control because this just becomes part of who they are. Mm-hmm. He discussed how this law is telling us how you could recover from addiction. So just that paradigm of applying things in a way that touches me in my daily life, my addictions, my temptations, my weaknesses. Mm-hmm. And literally, whatever he touched, he would always go to the, at the end of the discussion, he would say, and now let's discuss what's the lesson for this in life. There was no topic that was off limits. I remember once, this is in 86, the Rebbe gave a long, deep presentation about the Lurianic doctrine of Tzimtzum, which is a very abstract idea in Kabbalah, how the infinite God with the infinite created an empty space called a Chalal and Makam Panoi, and then brought in a Kav, which is a thread of light of infinity back into the empty space. But the Kabbalists say that there was a Rishimu, there was a residue of the light that never left. And he finished the discussion and he said, and all of this is reflected in human life and how a person lives on their daily basis. And he started to explain what Simtsum, Kav, and Rishimu and Chalal and Makampanui mean in the internal psychological life of a person. So here you're hearing great, great mystical concepts that most people, when they talk about it, you feel either they don't understand it, and even if they do understand it, it's like, life and really learning how this shapes not just your life but all aspects your interactions and your relationships and your self-esteem he actually spoke about self-esteem then it was it was fascinating what was the insight when you said uh, if you sell it, it it starts all over again if you sell the animal it starts all over again and he explained that emotionally that one of the he said there's two ways for recovery the talmud says one way is you train the bull you train it and you retrain it to stop goring. In other ways, you just sell it. And he explained that it's two ways in dealing with your animal, with your addict. One is actually have to work with it. We would call today a lot of analysis and a lot of inner work. Another way is if you could really surrender it to the domain of God and really surrender, mm. give your animal over to God, then everything changes and animal referring to that like animal soul and the, the bodily habit the animal inside of me the the, the chimpanzee or the gorilla the inside the of monkey me. mind huh i said the monkey mind and then the the habitual habits the reptilian brain if you're amygdala you're a it's, a, it's, it's a great uh you brought up a great topic that i i also wanted to uh transition to so it's a perfect transition it has to do uh, with like addiction and you often talk about it and how uh, I think it was one of the recent um, uh, classes you have also how people with addiction really have one of the greatest souls. And I used to be, uh, I used to have an addiction with biting my fingernails and have found uh, meditation and the tools like that to really um benefit me in in being able to separate and notice that habit to be able to not react uh, in doing that motion from certain thoughts or or feelings or emotions that that are that would arise. Um, Tying that with approach to Judaism and all the different observances and practices there are, I have I have felt not just felt but experienced Sometimes I think you shared, I forgot what poet has this line, but I, I one time thought about this and wrote it down and then heard it, you were expressing from this poet uh, 
the saying, I'm running from you to you. And that was, I had, I had pretty much written that nearly word for word one time in my own experiences with feeling like I'm running from what would be considered like observances, like, you know, you're not supposed to do uh, this on uh, Shabbat or whatever it is, but I would run from it, meaning I, I would let go, as you said, I would surrender. And if I did this, great, if not, you know, it's okay too. And then it was like an internal Shabbat. So it was like this feeling of paradox that I would run from what would be observant or an obligation. And then I would return like less uh, trying to force, oh, this has to happen. This has to happen. happen. And I also, uh, it's, it's a very um, in, important question and topic because I also can can pick up on, there's sometimes conversation, I mean, arguments come about uh, between, you know, ourselves and, and fellow Jews is, no, you can't use this uh, because this happened or you can't do that. And how do you really distinguish and create a, a fine, um, authentic balance between the observance, but not being absorbed by it? Beautiful question, beautiful question. And in, in applying it also with uh, kosher and uh, r religion. Yeah. So this is a very important, oops. This is a very important topic you bring up. And um, I think to give a very brief and a very authentic answer, it really depends on the approach of how one deals with it. Meaning, if I'm playing basketball, or football, professionally, or even non-professionally, there are laws that dictate the game. And breaking those laws will immediately destroy the game and the fun because it becomes chaotic. Yeah. When I'm playing, when I'm part of a symphony and I'm playing my music, I'm also following very, very decisive, particular notes. And if I say, no, I just want to be a free spirit. I want to experiment. That's wonderful. Sit at night by your piano and be a free spirit. But now it's going to destroy the symphony. And the same is true. The physician who is biologically scrutinizing your body may be operating. It's extremely, extremely nuanced, especially if you're dealing with something in the brain, something in the heart. The precision is so meticulous because every element of it is so precise and situated in the exact space. So I think we can all appreciate this very profoundly. When one can see halacha as a symphony, the Baal Shem Tov said that halacha law is an acronym of four words in Psalms. Hariyu Lashem Kol Haaretz. Let the whole world sing to God. Halacha is basically allowing ourselves to see the whole world, the whole planet, as a symphony. And our relationship with nature is based on this symphonic resonance. Yeah. And the details, not only are they not restrictive, they're act actually channels for the vibration of the divine flow, of the divine ebb and flow, as you say. Yeah. When I strip halacha from spirituality, when I strip it from the symphony, indeed, it could become extremely repressive and restrictive. And that's why it's so important to have that bird's eye view of Judaism, to be able to appreciate the full tapestry of Judaism, to be able to appreciate the fusion between the nigla and the nister, between the revealed and the esoteric, between the body and the soul, between the outer layer and the inner layer. Once one can learn Judaism from that perspective, now the details are like the notes of a ballad. Yeah. But when it, when it comes to applying that, with, like with your analogies of 
with the sports, you know, let's say you basketball, I played college basketball, you step out of bounds or you turn the ball over. The way that I, you know, and then hold that first, uh, put a pause on that. Also, a lot of uh, what you what you, uh, you talk about, you know, the importance of the story, what we tell ourselves. So then with those two things together and the, the beautiful uh, explanation of like with it being a symphony, how can we then cultivate that approach to, I want it to be this way, but I'm also not confined by it because then it can also be, if I'm, if I'm playing super, super um, protective, you know, playing basketball and there's, you know, there's out of bounds, there's, you have, you have to pass the half court with eight seconds. If I also look at it, like I'm breaking it or it's like a, God forbid something bad would happen if I don't do it that way, then I'm going to be hesitant and, you know, going to that side of the court, if you're still following near the, the out of bounds or with the, with the music, you know, uh, I often share a great uh, story that I feel often um, fits well with ebb and flow. The great um, uh, jazz player, Winston Marsalis, one time played, um, was playing a, a, a beautiful a one man show and somebody's phone goes off in the, um, in the concert hall. And everybody stops and he just to uh, speed it up. He, he leaves the room and every, and the guy stopped, he stopped playing and everything happened. And it would have been like a perfect, like it would be perfectly natural or okay for him to like, to erupt or get out of here. But instead he started like re reversing, playing the tune of the guy's ringtone back to where he left off and then continued. And it turns out to be even better than he could have, anybody could have imagined. So how, with all of those and to, 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 uh, conclude and to recapulate because it is also important the story that we tell ourselves and the approach with yeah, very. How, I would, how say, the, I would say the key is not to come at it from a judgmental place Interesting. Okay. towards yourself and not towards others in other words if I'm a musician and I'm sitting down to play as part of this beautiful symphony the worst thing I can do is start judging myself and it's like, if you play the wrong note, you're evil and you're horrible and you're, you're a sick person and you're going to be penalized and you're going to be punished. And now you can't even enjoy the music because you're so filled with guilt and self-loathing and negative energy. It's really an opportunity. Halacha is a gift and it's, it's an invitation. It's an invitation that by playing these notes, you can channel this energy through your psyche through your body, through your brain, through your home, through your world. It's a gift. It's an invitation. More than anything, Jewish law is describing reality. It's describing the spiritual science of the universe. So here are opportunities. Here are chemistries that will generate nuclear, positive, divine light into the world. And here are combinations and chemistries. If I mix meat and milk, right? And I cook meat and milk, a cheeseburger, and then I eat it. More than anything, before we hear it as judgment, hear it as the science of the universe, the spiritual science of the universe. I'm sharing with you the various forces that exist and the possible different chemistries that you can create when you eat, when you communicate, yeah. when you're together with somebody, how you do business, and it's a gift and it's an opportunity to live a life that is aligned with the inner rhythm of the universe. To live a life that allows you to bring out the inner potential within yourself, to live your own life to the fullest according to your spiritual design, according to your spiritual DNA. Imagine you come to a nutritionist and the nutritionist tells you, I'm looking at your blood type, these foods, are super good for you. And these foods are super bad for you. It's not about judgment. Oh, my nutritionist was so judgmental. He said, Rabbi, why, why no more carbs, no more sugar. He wasn't judgmental at all. He was just telling me, if you want to live life to the fullest, if you want to have a powerful flow of adrenaline, 
if you want to be full of energy and gusto and um and passion and enthusiasm and you don't want to feel heavy and lethargic and despondent and depressed and dejected make sure that your bloodstream <laughs> is not infected by these types of foods because they're poisonous for you so we're hearing these voices of judgment. You know, you're bad and you're getting worse and your temptations are horrible and you're a bad person and God hates you, then you're missing the boat. But if the ultimate nutritionist of the cosmos says here, these are thoughts, these are words, these are behaviors, these are foods that will allow your soul and your body to maximize their potential, to live up to their truest inner energy. It's an opportunity, it's a gift. And you make mistakes. Yes, you make mistakes. And then you got to learn from your mistakes. And you know what happens when you learn from your mistakes? As your story with the jazz music. Sometimes you create even a deeper music. Yeah. And that's why the Talmud says that with the Baal Tshuva stands, the Tzaddik can't stand. Because taking darkness and transforming it into light creates an even more powerful music. Yeah. So I think we have to graduate the judgmental model and turn more into a model of, of an opportunity to be able to live a meaningful and productive life. You hit the nail on the head. I, I, I definitely, that hit a chord in me. And I feel like sometimes we do it unconsciously. Of course. Yeah. I, sometimes we have voices, traumatizing voices that hold us down, that cause us to engage in self-loathing, self-shame, self-hate. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 uh, I met somebody the other day, and this person tells me, my mother is angry at me. And I was thinking to myself, this person's mother died almost two decades ago. Yeah. <laughs> but they're still feeling their mother is, he's still feeling that his mother is angry with him. Yeah. You know, where is that coming from? His mother loves him. His mother is in the world of truth. But inside of him is a voice that doesn't stop telling him what a shmata he is. I met somebody this week, and the person told me that their father used to call them a mechutzef. You know what a mechutzef is? Somebody has chutzpah. You know what chutzpah is? Mm -hmm. Somebody who's very aggressive and, and disrespectful and... Uh, Oh, I've, heard it. I've heard it more in the positive sense. You've got chutzpah. There's chutzpah in the positive sense, like audacious and gutsy. Yeah. Also chutzpah is, you know, disrespectful to your parents and your peers and your teachers and your mentors. So this poor little girl was trained by somebody in her family, mechutzpah, that she's always disrespectful. Why? Because she had an opinion of her own. She still has and has a lot of the personality and a lot of individuality and a lot of fire. And this person came to me this week and says, you know, I st I'm still hearing an older person already, but they still hear in their vo in their mind, they still hear their words. Every time they have an opinion, you're a machutzaf, you're disrespectful, you're disrespectful. So it's so important to be able to observe these voices and not allow them to dictate our lives and to control us and to live by them and to make choices by them because they're paralyzing voices. That's, that's where meditation has been very uh, powerful. And meditation, mindfulness, and awareness, yeah. the different forms of awareness of realizing what belongs to you and what doesn't belong to you. Yeah. <laughs> what you have to own and what you don't have to own. Yeah. It may be part of me, but I don't have to own it. I love with compassion. Yeah. With compassion, not with aggression. I love all that you're bringing up because it's, you know, when I prepare what I, what topics I want to uh, talk about and, you know, like you were also talking about earlier, just being present and listening, the things that you bring up also kind of like invite what I had written down beforehand. So I just love how connected uh, it is. Okay. Moving on. So you're a kindred spirit. <laughs> oh, hearing, hearing that from you, that's awesome. With the there's with things like um, so I want to transition like you're saying with things like let's call it knowns in our life from whether it's people like you're saying this example you just brought up or even food for that matter there's a level of transcending it and not allowing that thing external thing person place environment food whatever it is technology our phone 
to influence, to, to not influence, but to dictate how we're feeling. So how, how can we also distinguish and create that fine uh, split hair between, with, with following, let's say, for, for the sake of this uh, question, kosher laws. And like you're saying, eating the meat and the cheese is uh, a common example. Even my non-Jewish listeners will understand. Uh, and not allowing it to affect you, meaning, okay, I had the meat. Maybe I'll feel a little bloated, but that's a physical thing. How do I t- t- lower the volume or turn off the mental noise that, oh my God, I just had a unkosher food and, and balancing that tr- uh, transcendence of not allowing that thing to um, affect me while also um, going by what the Torah says or the interpretations of- It's a great question. There's a very important distinction that's made in the Tanya, chapter chapter 31. Yeah. It's a distinction between two words in Hebrew. One is called atzvus, and one is called merirut. Atzvut is guilt and depression. Merirut is remorse with a resolution for the future. And that's the difference. I could make a mistake, and the question is what I do with it. Let's say I ate the piece of cheesecake that I wasn't supposed to eat, and I'm feeling bloated, and I'm feeling lethargic, I'm feeling heavy. There's two available responses. One response is, Rabbi Y.Y., you're a loser. (laughs) You have no self-control. You're a shmata. You never do the right thing. You're just just not capable. You're inept. You're going to be doing this for the rest of your life. In other words, a real sense of guilt where I disqualify myself, I delegitimize myself, I really slander myself. The Chafetz Chaim said, you're not allowed to gossip about other people, you're also not allowed to gossip about yourself. You start gossiping about yourself in your mind. I'm bad, I'm crazy, I'm sick, I'm insane, I'm a loser, I'm a victim, I'm traumatized, I'm an idiot, I'm a moron, I have no self-control. Why can't I be like this one, et cetera. I'm a shlemiel, I'm a shlemazel, all the good, beautiful words that you say about yourself. You could look them up in the dictionary. There's another approach. And the other approach is, yes, I'm feeling remorse for what I did. I feel bad. I made a mistake. And the question is, okay, I did something that was wrong, but I am not wrong. I I am not bad. I have a voice in me that I have to learn about. I have temptations I have to learn about. I maybe have trauma in me that I have to deal with, but I'm not inherently evil. So I'm going to use this mistake as a springboard for awareness, as a launching pad for a much deeper, mature self-evaluation. Why do we even look at it as a mistake, though? I may have made a mistake, but if the mistake becomes a source of education retroactively, I transform it from a mistake into a catalyst for renewal. I have made, maybe at a moment of weakness, at a moment of weakness where I made a miscalculation, where I thought I can get away with it. Let's say I insulted you by mistake or intentionally. I was angry. I didn't sleep enough last night, okay? I had a hard day. I came home and I said something nasty to my spouse or my child, right? Or you came on to a Zoom and I said something nasty to you. I lost it. And I finish and I feel bad, I feel remorse. So here's the focus, the focus could be I'm a horrible person or I pick up a phone or I come back on Zoom and I say, I'm sorry. (laughs) I lost myself, I had a moment of weakness, I made a mistake, I am sorry, I apologize and I learned from Admit that when I'm exhausted, I shouldn't do Zooms. <laughs> or when I'm exhausted and I'm starving, I shouldn't just come home and, and, and use my children as a punching uh, bag. Yeah. I should go into the garage and take a bat and punch the tires of my car 300 times, do 65 push-ups, let out all my steam, and then come home and smile. So my point is, I make a mistake and I feel remorse. And this is what tshuva means. Tshuva means accountability. Don't be perfect, but be accountable. Don't run away from your errors. 
Don't hide. Confront them and tell yourself and tell people you trust and tell people who can help you confidants. I made a mistake and I want to now learn how to not repeat it, how to make amends and how to do it better next time. That's what growth is. Yeah. I am not from the philosophy that eliminates remorse in our world not to traumatize people because that traumatizes people even more. Some people think that self-esteem is gained from not letting people acknowledge that they make mistakes, that they're wrong. No, that's not good for people. Then they become slaves to their most superficial base instincts. You know, we have two extremes. One extreme is everything is about guilt. And the other extreme is there's no guilt anymore in the world because there's nothing you do that's wrong because everything is relative. And both extremes are extremely not healthy for people. They don't help people. You know the joke? There was a guy who would come into the bar every night and he would order a drink and he would take the glass and throw it at the bartender. The bartender said, I'm going to call the police. And he said, I'm sorry, I have this unconscious rage that comes out and I apologize. And the next night he does and I'm going to call the police. I'm so embarrassed. I have this crazy anger that comes from my mother, my father, my grandparents, codependence, addiction, whatever it is. The next night he does it again. I'm calling the police right now. He says, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. I promise you, it's just not me. I have this demon. And he says, listen, I won't call the police if you promise me you're going to go to therapy. Nine months, I don't want to see you here. I want you in therapy. Okay, he disappears for nine months. He comes back after nine months, orders a drink, takes the glass, and throws it at the bartender. The bartender says, what happened? He says, I went to therapy, and now I'm not embarrassed anymore. <laughs> the point being, the point being is, we live in a generation where we're all trying to emancipate ourselves from shame. There's also a danger. <laughs> And the danger is that nothing I do is ever wrong. You can insult somebody. You can destroy your family. This is where I was. This is where I am. That's equally unhealthy. So that's the distinction in Tanya between guilt that leads to depression and remorse that leads to rejuvenation. Nice. When it comes to applying all of that we've learned and, and discussed today, uh, one thing I find interesting and uh, or the you know our purpose is as as Jews and, and other nations is to reveal godliness in in the world. But what what exactly does that mean? Because I feel like it, I from different sources I feel like it's been explained it can kind of be taken to different ways i think it's i think it was well discussed in uh basi lagani um but i really love to cultivate a, a, a deeper understanding of really what it means given all that we discussed and i shared with you today that sometimes in the not observing i actually am observing more or observing more connected in a connected way, um, but I, it's it's very interesting to me, and you know I I'm I am on the the journey where you know let's say like with kosher, the kosher that I keep wouldn't necessarily be considered the highest level of kosher, um, but the way that I'm approaching it, you know, after meditation that I practice and with praying i'm not that i that voice isn't there oh my god this enclosure that kind of stuff i'm enjoying it i'm grateful that i have the coffee or whatever i have that i have i'll tell you a great story i was once in maryland for a spiritual conference it was it went on for a few days and there was a huge lunch <laughs> and the lunch was filled with pork and lobster it wasn't for me so i took out my little doggy bag and I had a tuna sandwich, and I started to eat it. The people there, wonderful people, all non-Jews, asked me, why don't you eat the food here? So I said, I keep kosher. So they didn't know the details, but they knew 
that you don't meet, you don't mix milk and meat. Yeah. So they said, you don't meet, meet, mix meat and milk. I said, yeah. So they said, why not? So I said, there's a few reasons, but one of the reasons is, you know, milk represents the life of the animal. The calf is nursing from its mother and the milk is its connection to life. That's how a mother nurtures and raises and develop, makes sure her child, her calf develops with the affection she gives the calf emotionally and with the nutrients that she gives the calf physically. So milk is the symbol of, is the symbol of life. It's what the calf is drinking from the mother, yeah. nursing it, giving it the nutrients it needs. The mother gives emotional affection to the calf and physical nutrients to the calf through the milk. So milk is the symbol of birth and life and strength. Meat, of course, you can only eat after the animal is dead. So the, the Torah says, the Bible says, don't cook a goat in the milk of its mother. Don't flavor this piece of meat that comes from the dead animal through the milk of its mother that's supposed to give life to the animal. It's respect, number one. Number two, I said to them, the Kabbalah says that meat represents gvura, yeah. represents strength, severity. Milk represents chesed. It's the flow of benevolence and kindness. And there always has to be boundaries between love and discipline. You know, this is a time for love. This is a time for discipline. You don't mix the two together. And they all looked at me and they said, wow, we don't want to mix meat and milk anymore. <laughs> we want to emulate this tradition. And I thought to myself, you know, I was maybe wrongly, I suspected there would have been Jews in the crowd. They may have been annoyed with me. Like, stop selling your religion and stop embarrassing us, you know? You want to be orthodox, keep it to yourself. But the non-Jews, they were so open and intrigued and they were inspired and they were like, wow, that's an amazing tradition that each time you eat meat or you drink milk, you recognize the boundaries, you know? And it showed, to, it showed me how sometimes, you know, you see from an outsider's perspective that they see it very differently. They see it as a song not as a judgmental, uh, obsessive, compulsive ritual. Yeah. But it, it's, it has an actual effect or it's just the representation? So number one, there's the representation. And number two, as I said earlier, yeah. the Torah is the spiritual science of the universe. So it speaks about, just like we learn about chemistry in our chemistry lessons. We also learn about spiritual chemistry in our spiritual chemistry lessons. Yeah. Some chemistries are not healthy for the Jewish soul, even if they're healthy for other souls. You got to know your genes. You got to know which chemistries work for you, which chemistries don't work for you. Eating bread on Pesach for a non-Jew is perfectly fine. Wonderful. If you want to eat carbs, <laughs> That's between you and your doctor. But I if think you, we eat more carbs on Passover. If your doctor lets you, you know, knock yourself out with pizza. For the Jew, this very ingredient becomes toxic because of certain energy in the world that he or she is sensitive to. Now, I could deny it. I could say it's not true. It's some invented myth. Okay, you could deny it, but it's not going to change reality. I was speaking to a group of teenagers. So they were saying, we don't want any laws and restrictions and we want to be free. I said, imagine you have a football field on the roof of a huge building. It's a huge roof, you know? And it's a great football field. There's no fence. How much fun are you going to have playing the game? It's going to be a nightmare. Every time you tackle somebody, you're afraid you're going to kill him or kill yourself because you could fall off the roof. What's the best thing I can do for you guys in order to make sure you have a great game? And they all said, build a fence around the roof. I said, yeah. The fences that Torah creates in our life are not here to spoil the fun. They're here to cultivate the fun. 
They're here to allow you to play the game in the best way possible, with the greatest fun possible. Because defenses protect us from places, situations, encounters, choices, temptations that cause us to fall. So uninhibited freedom sounds good theoretically, but practically it destroys people, makes them feel horrible with themselves. You know, tell a, tell a child, you're free to do whatever he or she wants. Okay. So he may sleep all day, become a couch potato, never go to school again, you know, never socialize again. And you become your own worst enemy in the name of freedom. There was a great Indian poet. He once said, only when the chords of the violin are tied down can the violin produce the most beautiful music. If the chords of the violin are untied, if you just let them go loose, there's no music. Okay. I find it true in life. We all have, we, we're all, each and every one of us is a violin. Rabbi Judah Halevi, Rabbi Judah Halevi has a poem about Jerusalem. He says, I am a harp for your melodies. And Nami Shomer paraphrased it in the song, Yerushalayim Shol Zahav, Jerusalem of Gold. L'chol shirayich ani kinor. I am a harp for all of your melodies, but it comes from Rabbi Yehuda Halevi from Spain, 12th century Spain, the author of the Kuzari. So he says, I am a harp for all your melodies. Each and every one of us is a harp or a violin. And we can produce the most exquisite music in the world. You have your music to produce. I have my music to produce. Each and every soul has its own music. But in order to produce your music, in order to emit and exude your music, I, ha I or you have to tie down the chords of my violin. And if I don't, it looks very wonderful. It's, fr it's a free violin, but there's no music playing. Only when my chords are tied down can my music really come out. I think that one of the biggest takeaways I, I got is approaching all that without the self-judgment. From yourself and from us. Simply not. Imagine somebody comes to the violinist and says, you know, you need to tie down the court. Just stop judging me. <laughs> stop being a tyrant. Don't control my life. Don't control my violin. He says, no, no, no. You have a Stradivarius. You have the greatest violin in the world. You have a Strat. It's going price is $15 million. And for you not to tie down those chords, it's a pity because the music that will come out of your violin is astounding. Stop judging me. My violins don't have to be untied. Don't be critical. At some point, I have to realize it's my own inner voices. I have to take accountability for it. He's not judging me. He's not judging my violin. <laughs> he wants the music to come out. Not judging me. <laughs> you get it, my friend. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your time. I, I no, just a final uh, topic. Um, I saw that you started having a cheers and uh, uh, classes on uh, what is uh, Mashiach, what is the Messiah. Uh, to, to conclude, uh, could you uh, talk a little bit about how all of that we've uh, discussed today uh, aligns with, with exactly that? Because uh, I what is Mashiach? It's a great question. It's one of the... One, one another, of the thing, another thing. Sorry. Why, I think we ought to change our vocabulary for coming of Mashiach for the continuous arrival. Because as, as the Rebbe even would say, you know, he's here. We just got to open up our eyes to see him. Right. So that's really the key. What Mashiach, Messiah, represents in, in Jewish history and in Jewish consciousness is an idea of realizing what always exists, that we're all one, that each of us is an ambassador of God in this world. All of us are ambassadors of the divine in this world, ambassadors of love, light, hope, healing, authenticity, integrity, wisdom, redemption. Mashiach is the recognition that there's an organic oneness that pervades the entire universe, the entire planet, because each of us is really a manifestation of divine energy in this world. 
the revelation of this consciousness, that's what Mashiach is. So Mashiach is the notion that God conceived the world in love. The world has a purpose, and that purpose is ultimately going to be realized in a very real way. It's not just going to be in the books, and it's not just going to be in your own meditation for a few moments, but it's going to become the reality of each and every one of us as individuals and as collectives. The Rebbe used to, the Lubavitcher Rebbe used to speak a lot about living with the consciousness of Geula, which really means already now opening ourselves up to that possibility of becoming a conduit for infinity, becoming a conduit for infinite love and light, not allowing my traumas to dictate my life, not allowing my limitations not holding on to my connections, to the cords that connect me to my exile mentality. Now, each and every one of us has to liberate ourselves because I have things that connect me, yeah. the mentalities of exile. They hold me back. They hold me down because they're not allowing me. I'm not allowing myself to acknowledge myself for what I really am which is an expression of God's infinity in this world. And Mashiach is the real faith that that truth, which is always there, is going to emerge in its full intensity and vigor and splendor. Amen. Now. Amen. Thank you, thank you so much for uh, taking all the time to sharing your space or as as you like to say to your Zoom students for gracing us with your presence. It's, it's, it's honestly, it's, it's, it's a great privilege and pleasure. I, I always look forward every week to listening to at least one or two of your classes. Thank you. That means a lot. And following along, uh, whether it's something that I had read or learned about, or, you know, like the, <laughs> learning the, 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 um, the discourse about the Sufarat Homer, which is, we're counting why we have our big old beards right now. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much, Rabbi. It's, it's such a pleasure. You were, when I was first starting a podcast, uh, you know, I would write down the people that I want to interview. And one year ago, I interviewed your brother, Simon Jacobson. And now here we are, I'm, I'm getting to interview you. So thank you, thank you. Honored. And may you, Solomon, have a lot of success in your work to bring more awareness and more light into many people's lives and good spirits. Thank you. Help us all open our eyes and behold a deeper, a deeper reality inside each of us. Thank you. The yeshiva.net on, on all platforms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful week and a great Shabbat. Thank you, thank you.